Hi everyone, welcome back. Today's lecture is going to focus on chapter 9, which is entitled Sexual Reproduction and Meiosis. Now just a quick little reminder, chapter 8 and chapter 9 are cohesive themes because they're going to allow us to focus on cell reproduction in the form of mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis was the subject of chapter 8, and now what we're going to do in chapter 9 is we're going to take a look at meiosis. The reason that we need to discuss these two forms of cell reproduction all has to do with the fact that we complete sexual reproduction, which means that when it's time for us to produce gametes or sex cells, we need to have a form of cell reproduction that will allow us to only pass on half our genetic information. When it comes to the rest of the cells in our body, our somatic cells, those cells, when they need to be replaced, they will consistently need to have 46 chromosomes or two pairs of 23, as you can say. And in that case, you would be doing mitosis. Now, just a quick reminder. Remember, when it comes to reproduction overall, you have asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. And I want to show you this little chart that's in our chapter because it will really highlight why it's so important to come up with a way to increase genetic variety in a population. So, Remember, when you do asexual reproduction, you are looking at just one source of DNA, which means that the offspring is completely identical. Of course, this doesn't account for any mutations that might occur. On the other hand, when you do sexual reproduction, you're able to mix at least two sources of DNA together, creating a hybrid offspring, an offspring that is more genetically diverse than the parental strands. Now, from a scientific point of view, it takes more time and it takes more effort to complete sexual reproduction, but it's worth the benefit. And part of that is because our environment that we have to adapt to, that we have to live in, is consistently changing. So in the diagram that you see on the PowerPoint, you see two scenarios where you have a look at a population over time. And in our first scenario, we're going to look at a population that does asexual reproduction, which means that as time goes by, so we increase the number of organisms in this population. But from a genetic diversity, everything sort of stays the same because there's only one source of DNA. And that's all great until you encounter something like an ecological disaster, for instance, a severe drought, severe flooding, something that will take out the majority of the food source or housing that that organism is used to. In this new environment that's created by the disaster, it's gonna be an all or nothing scenario. If the organism is able to adapt, then everybody's able to adapt. But if the organism is not able to adapt, what we see happening is that it will cause all of the other organisms that have the same DNA, the same adaptations, it will cause them to not be able to adapt, meaning that they will become extinct. On the other hand, what you can do is you can take a look at your bottom graph, where we also have a population and we look at it over time, but now we're doing sexual reproduction. And with the introduction of multiple DNA sources, what we see happening is that the offspring starts to have an increased amount of genetic variety, which is indicated by the branching of our original red cone. Notice how it goes from red to blue, and that's to highlight the fact that over time, you'll get significant changes in the DNA that evolution can be uh, seen. And that then means that you have a huge amount of diversity within this population. So if that ecological disaster comes and if it wipes out a food source, it would probably mean that it will affect the majority of the population. But those of us who are diverse enough to adapt will be able to continue to live and thrive and find additional food sources for us to continue our reproduction cycle. So sexual reproduction is worth the time and the effort because from a biological sense, it gives us lots of genetic variety. Now, speaking of our DNA, just a quick reminder, remember all our DNA is coiled up tightly in the form of chromosomes. And as humans, we have 46 chromosomes, or we can say we have 23 pairs. And the reason we can say we have 23 pairs is because you get one from mom and one from dad. So here on the illustration, we have what we call a karyotype. 
A karyotype is a map of all our chromosomes. And as you look at it, you're going to notice that the chromosomes are paired up. And they're also numbered 1 through 22, starting with the tallest or the longest, all the way down to the shortest. And then you have another set of chromosomes that are, do not have a number, but instead they're labeled XX or XY. Now here's how it's going to go. The reason that they're paired up is because remember you have two sources of DNA, one from the maternal mom, one from the paternal dad. So the pairs are lined up based on their source. And then one through 22 is what we call autosomes. And auto means that they're basically found in both male and female. So the autosome chromosomes, chromosomes one through 22 are found in every single organism, or I should say every single human, regardless of what sex we're looking at. The biological sex of the organism is going to be determined by the 23rd pair of chromosomes. Those do not get a number. Instead, they will get a letter. You have the option of getting an XX, which would make you a biological genetic female, or an XY, which would make you a genetic male. So here in our picture, we see our two scenarios between the two X's and the X and the Y. Now, one thing that I do want to point out is even though we get two sources of our DNA, and as we saw in our karyotype, they will be aligned. So mom will give you 1 through 22 plus a sex chromosome, and dad will give you 1 through 22 plus a sex chromosome. The pairs that are formed between 1 and 22, those are called homologous pairs of chromosomes. Homologous pairs of chromosomes highlight the fact that both of them will carry the same genetic genes. Both of them will look alike, so they'll have like the same length. But because they come from different sources, not all the genes will have the same alleles. Alleles are variation of the genes. So for instance, on the illustration right here, we see two chromosomes that look identical to each other. Notice how they went ahead and they colored one pink to um, highlight the fact that it was inherited from the mother. And this one is highlighted blue because it's inherited from the father. And as we can see on both of the chromosomes, you have the gene A, gene B, and gene D. Now, Imagine that, for instance, gene A would determine hair color, right? There are different versions of the gene. You can have the gene that will determine that your hair is going to be black, brown, red, or blonde. Now, your mom will give you a gene for hair color, and your dad will give you a gene for hair color, but they don't have to give you the same version or the same allele for that particular gene. Mom, for instance, might give you the gene for brown hair, and dad will then give you the gene for blonde hair. So you get a mixed bag of alleles because they come from two different sources. So the fact that you get two copies of these chromosomes indicates the fact that you have a homologous pair. They come from two different sources, so they might carry the same genes, but not all the genes are equal because they come in variations. They come in alleles. In our next chapter, we're going to talk about the fact how some of the alleles are what we call dominant. So as soon as you inherit that from one parent, you automatically have that particular phenotype or appearance um, or trait. And some of them are going to be recessive, which means that they are hidden away and will only make an appearance if both parents are able to pass that gene along. So even on your illustration, you're going to notice that some of the alleles are indicated by a capital letter and some are indicated by a lowercase letter. So they're highlighting the fact that there's different versions or alleles that you inherit from each of the parents. So please keep that in mind. Anytime you see the term homologous chromosome, I want you to think that means I have a pair. They come from two different destinations, or I should say two different origins, one from mom, one from dad. They will look the same. They will have the same genes, but not all the genes are the same because they come in different alleles. So overall, they are not identical. And as we're continuing our conversation,
conversation, remember that as humans or any type of organism that does sexual reproduction, when we do sexual reproduction, we're only able to pass half our genetic information off to our offspring. So this is one of the reasons why we need to produce our gametes, our sex cells. Gametes, our egg and our sperm, are only going to be able to carry one set of our chromosomes, so only 23 instead of 46. So these are what we consider haploid. Haploid means one copy of everything. The rest of our cells, our somatic cells, are going to be diploid, which means they get two copies of everything. They get the homologous chromosomes, so they get 46 chromosomes. And as you may recall from the life cycle that we saw in chapter eight, there will be an interplay of meiosis and mitosis, depending on if you are producing gametes or if you're producing somatic cells needed to grow and maintain the body. So we can take a look at our two little frogs right here. And as you can see, they will be able to release their gametes and the gametes are produced due to meiosis because meiosis will allow it to go from a diploid, two copies of everything, to a haploid cell, one copy of everything. And that's okay because once fertilization occurs and the sperm and the egg reunite, then we see that our zygote, our fertilized egg, becomes a diploid cell again. And that diploid cell will continue to grow and allow that one-celled organism to become a multi-celled organism through the use of mitosis. So mitosis will give us daughter cells or next generation cells that will always be diploid or what the original cell was. Whereas meiosis will allow us to go from diploid to haploid and produce cells that only have half the genetic information. So please keep that in mind. And as you're perusing through the chapter, if you see a mention of germ cells, that's the same thing as the gametes. So those are gonna be the cells that are in the ovaries and the testes are reproductive cells that are gonna make the egg and the sperm cells. Somatic cells are the rest of the body cells that we have. So these are the cells that form our body that have nothing to do with reproduction. So your skin cells, your liver cells, your um, stomach cells, your kidney, your liver, all those cells need to consistently have 46 chromosomes, so they will do mitosis. Whereas your germ cells are your gametes. They are your sex cells. They need to do meiosis so they can half their genetic load, go from 46 to 23. Now, when we did chapter eight, we talked about the fact that mitosis occurs in various steps, right? We have our prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And at the end of mitosis, you walk away with two daughter cells that are identical to what you started with. So we started with 46, we're gonna end with 46. In meiosis, we're gonna see that it's going to be a little bit different. And the reason for that is because meiosis has an end goal of producing cells that only have half the chromosomes of the original cell. So we wanna go from diploid to haploid, from 46 to 23. And as meiosis is doing that, it's also gonna allow for genetic variety to be increased by mixing the chromosomes that can interact between the egg and the sperm cell. So you're gonna have genetic variety, increased genetic variety in meiosis, which you don't have in mitosis. And instead of producing two cells, we're gonna produce four cells. So meiosis gives us two daughter cells. My, I'm sorry, mitosis gives us two daughter cells. Meiosis will give us four cells that are haploid and are genetically different than the original cell. Here is a little illustration of it. So as you can see, we're gonna start off with our original cell that is diploid. And what we're gonna do in meiosis is we're gonna talk about the specific steps that need to be done. And it's a two-step process. And during those two steps, our end goal is going to be to produce four daughter cells and see how the daughter cells are labeled as haploid because they only carry half the genetic information. So we're gonna go from 46 
or two pairs of 23 diploid to 23, only one pair being labeled as haploid. The other thing that we're also gonna see is that our homologous chromosomes, so here you have the pair, mom and dad, here you have the pair, mom and dad, they are going to be split to create genetic variety in the haploid daughter cells that are being produced. Now, what exactly is the process of meiosis, right? So you see on your table, you have meiosis one, you have meiosis two. Let's talk about the events that are taking place between that. And in order to do that, I wanna remind you that in chapter eight, we talked about the cell cycle and the cell cycle will start with interface. You will see the same exact thing in meiosis. All cell cycles will start with interphase, where the cell will be divided into G1, gap phase one, S, synthesis, and G2, gap phase two, or growth phase two. This is the phase where the cell spends most of its life. This is the phase where the cell is doing its day-to-day -day activity, transcription, and translation. And remember, it has to do the S phase because it has to double its DNA from 46 to 92. Just like when we talked about mitosis, we're gonna start with interphase. At the end of interphase, we're gonna do our cell division, and now we're gonna switch over to meiosis. So when we do meiosis, we're gonna say the same steps, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. But we're gonna do everything twice. So you're gonna notice in your notes that it's gonna talk about meiosis part one, and meiosis part two. Meiosis part one is gonna focus on the homologous chromosomes, the pairs that you inherit from mom and dad, and how we can pair them up and separate them. And also in meiosis one, you're gonna have this unique event called crossing over. And it's gonna allow the homologous chromosomes to shovel genetic information. This is gonna increase our genetic variety. Crossing over exclusively occurs in prophase one. So see how you have the one because we're gonna do everything twice. In fact, if we were to compare the first part of meiosis and the second part of meiosis, we're gonna see events that we're already familiar with. We're gonna see the mention of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Same thing as we did in our last chapter. The difference is, is that we're gonna do everything twice. So you're gonna see in your book that it labels meiosis part one as being prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. Meiosis two will be prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two. The overall movement of the cells will be the same. So in prophase, you will always get rid of the nucleus so that the chromosomes become apparent. In metaphase, you'll always align them down the middle of the cell. Anaphase, you will separate them into two separate batches. And telophase, you will recreate the nucleus and at the end do cytokinesis. The difference is, is that since you're trying to go from one cell to four cells, we're gonna have to do it in two separate steps. The first part, meiosis one, will entail us taking our homologous chromosomes Pairing them up, so you can see right here in metaphase one, you pair up the homologous chromosomes, and through the use of anaphase one and two, you will go ahead and separate the homologous pairs, and you will go ahead and allow for the two cells to form, because telophase one will reform the nucleus and cytokinesis will split it apart. At that point, you are done with the first part of meiosis, but we wanna keep going because our ultimate goal is to perform, to produce four cells. So in the second part of meiosis, meiosis two, we're gonna take those chromosomes and we're gonna start separating the sister chromatids. And the sister chromatids are gonna align down the equator in metaphase two, and then in anaphase two, they will separate Telophase two, we will reform the nucleus and do cytokinesis, the separation of the cytoplasm. And since you had two cells that went into meiosis two, these two cells each individually split. So you have an end result of four cells where the sister chromatids are separated and you now have a haploid cell with 23 chromosomes each. 
I do want to point out that between meiosis one and meiosis two, you do have a quick second interface. However, there is no replication of the DNA in this interface. So whatever the cells had when they walked into meiosis two will go ahead and be divided. Let me show you this from an illustrative aspect. So here is our representation of our cells. And notice how they went ahead and they did prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And in prophase, they say to you, the chromosomes are becoming more condensed, more visible because the nucleus starts to disappear, which is what we're used to in prophase, right? So we're doing that the same thing. But what we see here is a unique event occurring, the crossing over. So you can see on the picture right here, you can see that the pink and the blue chromosome, the homologous pairs, are swapping genetic information so that you get like these little hybrid chromosomes that are mostly mom, a little bit of dad, mostly dad, a little bit of mom. We cannot predict how much crossing over is going to occur in each of the cells. So each cell is slightly different. But either way, in metaphase one, just like we're used to seeing, the chromosomes will align down the middle of the cell. The difference is, is that you are aligning the homologous chromosomes. So you want to keep an eye on that. Then the homologous chromosomes are going to separate the opposite poles, but the sister chromatids are still attached. In telophase one and cytokinesis one, you can see that the cytoplasm will start to split and the nucleus has reformed. So at the end of doing meiosis part one, you have two cells, but we're not done yet because remember we want four cells. So we're gonna step right into meiosis two. And after a quick interface, we're gonna repeat everything again. So notice how you now have two cells because that's what you produced at the end of meiosis one, and you're gonna repeat everything. Prophase two, get rid of the nucleus again. Metaphase two, line up the cells down the equator. Anaphase two, now we're gonna split the sister chromatids. Telophase two and cytokinesis, reform the nucleus, split the cytoplasm, and your end result is that you get four cells that are haploid and non-identical. The reason they're non-identical is because remember, you had the crossing over that occurred, and also you no longer have pairs of chromosomes, you only have one copy. So anytime you're looking at meiosis, you're gonna do everything twice, and the first part of meiosis will center around separating the homologous chromosomes the second part of meiosis will concentrate on separating the sister chromatids. And the crossing over the shoveling will only happen in prophase one. And it was allowed for us to have lots of genetic variety as we go ahead and complete meiosis. Now, speaking of crossing over, I just wanna highlight, it only happens during prophase one and it allows for two homologous chromosomes to swap their genetic information. Here is an illustration of it. So as you can see, you have the homologous pair. So remember, the chromosomes are paired up because you get one set from mom, one set from dad. So once they're paired, we can see that the pairs can go ahead and swap genetic information by creating a chiasma site, a crossing over site. This will be different for every meiosis, so that's why you get lots of genetic variety. You can never predict where exactly or if the crossing over is going to occur. Now, the part of meiosis one, the goal will be to separate the homologous pairs. So you can see at the end of meiosis one, you have dad's version and you have mom's version. And then at the end of meiosis two, we're gonna separate the sister chromatids. Remember, your sister chromatids are the end result of you doing DNA replication during interphase. So that's why when you come back to this original picture right here, you can see that they labeled for you that the two sides of the chromosomes are sister chromatids because the DNA has been replicated. So mom comes in with a duplicate section and dad comes in with a duplicate section. And in the first part of meiosis, we split mom and dad. And in the second part, we split the sister chromatids. 
if the chromatid that is separated is still an original copy, so the original from dad is indicated as all blue, from mom all red, we call that a parental cell because it's an identical copy from the parent. If crossing over has occurred and the chromatid now represents both parents, we call that a recombinant cell. A recombinant cell means crossing over has occurred and you now have a mix of both parents. So this is a lot of variety, which means that every sperm cell you make, every egg cell that you make is slightly different from one another because you have this potential of crossing over occurring. And in fact, from a statistical standpoint, if we take our 46 chromosomes, our 23 pairs, and we start taking a look at how many different versions we can produce of our gametes, they have calculated that you can produce over um, 8 million different combinations. So 8 million different sperm cells, 8 million different egg cells. And because on top of that, we're also going to be doing random fertilization, we see that when you have one couple and you try to calculate how many different options they have for creating a zygote, we get into 70 trillion genetically unique individuals that can be created. So this widely explains why when you have siblings from the same parents that you might look alike, but there will always be some slight variations because each sperm cell and each egg cell is slightly different from the others because of this randomization, this crossing over, and of course fertilization that occurs when you're mixing two haploids and you're making a diploid copy. <laughs> A lot of studies go and would like to see how DNA can vary from one individual to the next. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll try to go ahead and compare twins because you can have identical twins, which means that they come from one zygote, monozygotic, or you can have fraternal twins, which means they come from two eggs and two sperms. They're dizygotic. Remember, a zygote is a fertilized egg, right? So if you're able to compare an identical twin and a fraternal twin, you can see how the variety in DNA can make an appearance in the overall look or behavior um, or development of the child. So here we have a little illustration, and what it's showing you is in a monozygotic twin, which we like to call identical twin, we have one egg, that comes into contact with one sperm. So once that zygote is formed, very early on in development, it will split into two embryos. So this literally means that you have a genetic copy of each other. These children that are born as identical twins will genetically be either all boys or all females. And the reason for that is because the zygote is either XX or XY, and it's split in half, so it's making a duplicate copy. In fraternal twins, those are called dipsychotic twins because we see that there are two eggs and two separate sperms. So this allows us to create two separate zygotes, which means that you have two different embryos. So in this case, you can have a boy-girl combination from a genetic standpoint. You can also have two boys and you can also have two girls, but they will not be genetically the same because they came from two separate eggs and two separate sperms. So fraternal twins tend to happen when the mother ovulates multiple eggs within the same cycle. So if there's two different sperm cells that come into contact, she's basically carrying two separate babies just at the same time. In the uterus, what we see happening is that identical twins will often share a placenta, whereas fraternal twins will have two separate placentas, one for each of them, because once again, each of them come uh, from a slightly different genetic space because of the fact that they had their individual egg and they had their individual sperm cell. So when you take a look at mitosis and meiosis, you want to keep in mind that they're going to be sharing a lot of the same events and the events all have the same name, right? Everything started with interphase and then we did prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The differences are going to be how many times you repeat it, where does it occur in the body, and what the end result is. So for instance, in uh, mitosis, 
you will do that with your somatic cells, your everyday body cells. Meiosis will be uh, selectively for the gametes or the sex cells. So you'll only use meiosis when you're doing sperm and egg. The alignment of the homologous chromosomes is very important when you do meiosis, whereas when you do mitosis, you're just basically copying one from the other. The daughter cells that are produced are identical in mitosis. You get two cells that are identical, whereas in meiosis, you get four daughter cells that are haploid, so they only carry half the genetic information, and they also have genetic variety due to the effect of crossing over. So please keep that in mind, that if you wanna go from diploid to haploid, you need to do meiosis, but if you wanna produce cells that are the same, so diploid to diploid, you're gonna be doing mitosis. Here is a nice little look at the comparison. So you can see on top, we have our mitosis. We do our prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase once, and we get two daughter cells that are identical. In meiosis, we're gonna have to do everything twice. In the first part, we concentrate on crossing over and separating the homologous chromosomes. And in the second part, we concentrate on separating the sister chromatids. The end result is going to be four cells that are haploid and that are not genetically identical. Let me erase this real quick. There you go. So you can see they're haploid, only half the genetic information, and they're non-identical. Alrighty, so mitosis will give you the same. Meiosis will give you genetic variety by producing cells that only have half the genetic information. Now, sometimes, I wanna mention this real quick, um, there'll be a mistake that will happen along the way. Just like when we were talking about in chapter eight and we talked about the fact that if there is a um, mutation or a malfunction in the cell cycle, it can lead to different disease model like cancer. We can also see in meiosis that there could be a mistake. And when this mistake happens, oftentimes what we see is that you will create a change to the number of chromosomes. Polyploidy is the term that we use whenever there is an extra set of chromosomes. So you would get three copies of everything instead of two copies of everything. Now, a triploid copy in humans does not exist because the human body is very sensitive to having 46 chromosomes. So there has never been an example of a human being born that has 96 chromosomes or three copies of everything. We do see that plants, primarily flowering plants, are able to kind of fluctuate and go from diploid to triploid and back and forth. Um, part of that has to do with their evolutionary trend. For humans, we're more sensitive. So for instance, if we see that this thing called nun disjunction occurs, Usually what that means is that there's an abnormal amount of chromosomes, either an extra or a missing one. So instead of having 46, we'll either have 45 or 47. So in this case, you just have one extra or one less. Um, when this happens, we call it non disjunction. And it's due to the fact that during meiosis, there was a mistake that didn't allow the gametes the properly, I'm sorry, that didn't allow the homologous chromosomes or the sister chromatids to properly separate because none disjunction can occur during part one or part two of meiosis. And the end result is that you will produce gametes that are abnormal because they will have either an extra copy or they will have no copy at all. So because of this, you then start to see that the zygote that forms when for instance, the sperm and the egg unite, the zygote will either have too many or too few chromosomes. If this happens, a lot of times you will get what's called spontaneous abortion. And spontaneous abortion basically means that very early on in development, the zygote will stop and induce apoptosis. 
um, it will then go ahead and be cycled out of the body. Many times the woman won't even know that she was pregnant because it happened so early on and she will menstruate just as normal. A part of this, remember, is all about the fact that humans like to keep that 46 number of chromosomes. Now, are there some exceptions to the rules? Yes, there are certain disease models out there where we see that the embryo was able to tolerate one less or one too many chromosomes. Probably the best example of that is when we take a look at, um, at sorry, when we take a look at Down syndrome, my apologies. Down syndrome is when we have an extra autosome that appears, it can happen in chromosome 21, 18 or 13. The most common one is 21. So here on the karyotype map, you can see that the chromosomes are paired up. And when you get to chromosome 21, there'll be a trisomy. There will be three copies of it. So this individual has 47 chromosomes, not 46. And it's because of that extra chromosome that we then see a lot of the symptoms that are associated with Down syndrome, including some of the physical attributes and some of the behavioral and mental attributes. Now, this extra chromosome, this non disjunction, doesn't always have to occur in autosomes. If it occurs in autosomes, though, like what it did in our Down syndrome, that means that it will affect boys and girls at the same rate. Because remember, we all get those autosomes chromosomes. You can also have non disjunction occur in the sex chromosomes. And that would then mean that you either have too many or not enough of the X and the XY combination. So here on table 9.1, you see some of the examples of the abnormalities that have been absorbed in um, embryos that have continued to develop with one too many or one too few chromosome. Example, you can have triplo X, where the individual is born with three Xs. So this would be genetically a female born with 47 chromosomes. You can also have Klinefelder syndrome, which is when you have two X's and a Y, also 47. Now this would be genetically a male because of the appearance of the Y chromosome. You also have Jacob syndrome, that is one X and two Y's, once again, 47. And I do wanna point out that when you take a look at the symptoms, a lot of times the addition of the X chromosome will alter um, their ability to reproduce because they have an odd number of chromosomes. Um, most of the time, there will also be some physical attributes and um, occasionally there will be some mental um, or learning disabilities that will come in as well. The other one that I wanna show you is what we call Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is when an individual is born with 45 chromosomes, not 46, and that's because they only inherit one sex chromosome. They only get an X. The zero means there's nothing there. Now, the X means that they are genetically a female. And the unique part of this is that there has never been an embryo produced, or I should say successfully developed, that only has a Y chromosome. And the main reason for that is the X chromosome has all the information we need for the zygote to develop into a fetus and into an embryo. The Y chromosome is only there to determine that it's going to be a male, a genetic male. So the fact that if there is a non-disjunction and a zygote forms with only a Y chromosome, there would be too much genetic information missing for it to successfully continue development. So spontaneous abortion would set in. There are also examples where you can have abnormalities or um, in the chromosome, but like on a smaller scale. Part of this is what we can see right here. We can have examples where if this is our wild type or normal chromosome, and we take a look at the genes that they carry, we can see that there could be small abnormalities within the content itself. So for instance, you can have a deletion where part of the information is removed. So now you're missing genetic information and you have a shortened chromosome. You can have a duplication which means that some of the genes are duplicated. This is very well studied in what we call fragile X. 
Fragile X is a disease where the X chromosome will lengthen because of the duplicated genes that are attached. It's passed on from one generation to the next, and the more generations, the longer the X chromosome comes. It's called fragile X because the X chromosome, because of the length, is very fragile in its structure and can cause a lot of different disease models to make an appearance. You can also have what we call inversion. Inversion is when the order of genes is flipped. And a lot of times this can cause fertility problems because remember, we have homologous chromosomes. And if you have one set where the order is inverted, if crossing over occurs, it can cause an abnormal amount of genes to be transmitted. You also have what we call translocation. Translocation used to be called jumping genes. And it basically means that you can have certain sections from the chromosomes will swap or jump from one homologous pair to the next. So here you can see that the long chromosome is interacting with the short chromosome. They are not properly paired up and you have a mixed bag of genes that will hop from one chromosome to the next. This will often cause genes to be separated and once again can cause fertility issue just because of the lack of genes that may be transmitted from one gamete over to the zygote. Now, the whole concept of forming our gametes in humans is, of course, going to occur in the testes and the ovaries. And I do want to point out that it does have a specific name. Um, it's called spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Genesis means to create. So spermatogenesis takes a look at how meiosis is occurring and the production of the sperm cells. And oogenesis is, takes a look in the female body, how meiosis is occurring within the ovaries, and it has the production of the egg cells that are produced. So in case you see spermatogenesis and oogenesis, it just takes a look at the specific events that are happening within the gametes, including the meiosis and the production of the sperm and the egg cells. Now, I also wanna mention that in plants, we see a very similar setup of the use of mitosis and meiosis, but instead of referring to them as, you know, your gametes, or I should say your egg and your sperm cells, oftentimes what we see is we'll refer to them um, within their life cycle as having a sporophyte and a gametophyte. And what we see happening here is this thing called the alternation of generation, where you will have one part of the cell cycle that will be solely focused on being a sporophyte and being diploid and producing spores. And as the spores are being produced by meiosis, it will allow the transition from diploid to haploid. And that haploid part of the plant will then grow into a gametophyte. And the gametophyte, its job will be to produce gametes and since it's already haploid, it will produce the gametes through mitosis. Because remember, the gametes can only carry one half of the genetic information. Here, let me show you this in an illustration. So here we see our alteration of generation. So we could see the mature plant right here is our sporophyte. Notice that it is diploid. So the sporophyte gets its name because it's gonna produce spores but the spores are haploid, so that means we have to do meiosis. Once the spores are released, they will go ahead and duplicate their numbers through mitosis, consistently staying haploid, and they will then go ahead and give rise of the plant, that part we're gonna call the gametophyte. The gametophyte comes in a male and a female version, and as you can see, they are gonna be producing the gametes, and since the gametes are haploid, just like the gametophyte, it's going to be done through mitosis. Once the gametes reunite, they will go ahead and have fertilization and form the zygote. The zygote will restore the diploid function, and it will then use mitosis again to grow the mature sporophyte. And it will continue on. The sporophyte will do meiosis to produce spores, the spores will go ahead and do mitosis to give rise to the gametophyte, and the gametophyte will use mitosis 
to produce the gametes. So always keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on the life cycle. And remember, if your goal is to produce cells that are the same in genetic content as the parental cells, we will always use mitosis. If your goal is to produce cells that have half the genetic information, so for instance, go from diploid to haploid, then in that case, we will be using meiosis. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out. All right, everyone, we'll talk again soon. Bye.